Let me go back to where we were real quick. You know, even getting to the point of being able to fire him. So, you know, we were, we were very careful, very deliberate about um, who we told, which was essentially almost no one in advance other than, you know, obviously our legal team. And so that's kind of what took us to, to November 17th. Thank you for sharing that. Now, Sam was eventually reinstated as CEO with most of the staff supporting his return. What exactly happened there? Why was there so much pressure to bring him back? Yeah, this is obviously the the elephant in the room. And unfortunately, I think there's been a, a lot of misreporting on this. I think there were three big things going on that helped make sense of kind of what happened here. The first is that really pretty early on, the way the situation was being portrayed to people inside the company was you have two options. Either Sam comes back immediately with no accountability, you know, totally new board of his choosing, or the company will be destroyed. And, you know, those weren't actually the two, only two options. And the, the outcome that we eventually landed on was neither of those two options. But I get why, you know, not wanting the company to be destroyed got a lot of people to to fall in line, you know, whether because they were in some cases about to make uh, a lot of money from this upcoming tender offer, or just because they loved their team, they didn't want to lose their job, they cared about the work they were doing. And of course, a lot of people didn't want the company to fall apart, you know, us, us included. The, the second thing I think it's really important to know that has really gone underreported. And it's not just hey, money. Of course, people get payday. Everyone's get paid, get that. But also, they all, a lot joined because of Sam and they respected Sam. They joined because of Ilya too, but they respected him. They saw him, they believed in what he was doing. And they saw that, hey, this guy just got the shaft and he's given everything for this company, not getting paid. Am I next? <laughs> Like, it's just, that's why when companies do rolling layoffs, like, oh, we're just going to do more layoffs over the quarters. It's like, well, if, why am I working for a long-term project if my head gives me a chopping block? Like, there's a bro I know at Google, really good friends of mine. Um, he's like the fixer for uh, corp eng slash IT for HR. Anytime there's a problem in HR, he would come out, like, you would talk to regular rank and file people, they'd say, that, that's an issue, you're screwed, can't do anything, sorry about it. And you bring this guy in, and he would just be like, oh, sorry, I got into the system. I was there when it got built. You do this thing here, code this here, blah, 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 and I'll fix it for you. Like, he was just a god, and I, he's fantastic. He got called the analytics says, I pay for just two things on the web, ChatGPT and the Svic channel for its videos and associated Discord group. It's a unique forum for those interested in the advanced aspects of AI technology and business. Jordan Hunt says, it feels like an amazing community of people who are stupidly passionate about tech and are just straight up nice and absolute trove of information and life experiences. Plus, it's a great hub to keep up with the chaos that is AI at the moment, especially when life is keeping me busy. My anti-dead internet theory, home. We talk about robotics in here. We have a channel for AI, a place for research. People share their research papers in there. Memes and comedy, gaming, entertainment, investing, documentaries, name it, we got it. Hit that join button right now or support us on Patreon so you can get access to this community. The chopping block from Google. And when he got the, the shaft, I, I, when I was gone before them, I was like, oh, then this company has lost its soul. Like, you can't get people who are that good and have that much value and screw them over. Like, I, I can't be loyal to that per, this company now that they've screwed over my boy who's worked, given everything for the company. And I think the same thing for Sam Altman is fair, too. Um, let me know if that AC, if you can hear it in the background, it's too loud. Um, let's continue. Is how scared people are to go against Sam. Um, they had experienced him retaliating against, against people, retaliating against them for past instances of, of being critical. Um, they were really afraid of you know, what might happen to them. So when some employees started to say, you know, wait, I don't want the company to fall apart. Like, let's bring back Sam. It was very hard for those people who had had terrible experiences to actually say that for fear that, you know, if, if Sam did stay in power, as he ultimately did, you know, that would make their lives miserable. And I look, I've dealt with executives before at Google who hold grudges. Everyone, hold, people hold grudges. I've dealt with executives where it's just, you cross them and now you're on the list. And it's like, well, that's your, that's your VP. And it, it's, I don't, ideally it shouldn't be that way. We should all be like, turn the other cheek or something. But you know, that's the way corporate is. People remember things. And you, you cross the king, then people are going to realize that, like, hey, maybe it's not a good idea for me to be in this organization much longer because that person also controls promo. Now, I, what my assumptions are is that he 
spoke to these people numerous times about what their issues and concerns were and explained to them we're about their deployment, these issues are overblown. And it wasn't good enough for them. And they also realized, like, also, I don't have any, any facts on this, but just what my experience has been at from Google when I've seen these type of people, they're not willing to say, okay, well, I don't agree with what he's doing at this company and whatnot. I need to pack my bags, go to Anthropic or go somewhere else. Um, and I know it's not perfect. People have families. They, have, they don't want to leave. They're comfortable and whatnot. But there's a certain degree of this is the mission. This is what we're trying to achieve. Get in line or go somewhere else. And that is something that Coinbase has put out. That's something that uh, Palantir has come out. Uh, Andrill Systems has come out with Palmer Lucky about like we're here for, you know, or Coinbase, you're here for crypto. We're not here for all the politics. And the other two companies I mentioned, we're here to help armed forces and protect democracy. And if you don't support those things, then this is not the right company for you to be at. Um, okay. Uh, it says, the horse says, my dude, you need to install uh, NVIDIA Broadcast. I, I think I need to. I think they thought they were. Uh, okay. The horse says, it's not too loud and we'd rather have you lucid than heat exhausted. <laughs> A trade-off is there's always a trade-off with everything. Good, good point. Um, yeah, I need to probably install that. I just just so many things to install on this computer. And I guess the last thing I would say about this is that this actually isn't a new problem for Sam. And if you look at some of the reporting that that has come out since November, it's come out that he was actually fired from his previous job at Y Combinator, which was hushed up at the time. That's incorrect, Paul Graham. Uh, explain that and uh yeah and then at you know his job before that which was his only other job in silicon valley his startup looped um apparently the management team went to the board there twice and asked the board to fire him for what they called you know deceptive and chaotic behavior if you actually look at his track record he doesn't you know exactly have a glowing trail of references this wasn't a problem specific to um the personalities on the board i have to look into loop but he's Casting a lot of aspersions here. Oh, she's casting a lot of aspersions here. Uh, it sounds like a, she's got an axe to grind. As much as he would love to kind of portray it that way. So I had to ask you about that, but this actually does tie into what we're going to talk about today. OpenAI is an example of a company that started off trying to do good, uh, but now it's moved on to a for-profit model and it's really racing to the front of this AI game along with all of these. Nonprofit with... It's a nonprofit. With an LLC, and the LLC is there to take investment so they could build all the wonderful products you're using right now. And GPT-4, O, or 40 ounce is now free for everyone. So, again, either get the Bill Gates Foundation to give you a check for billions of dollars to train these models, or you can shut your mouth. It's like ethical issues that are raised in the wake of this progress. And you could argue that the OpenAI saga shows that trying to do good and regulating yourself isn't enough. How is it? Tell me what issues are arising besides these people trying to play God and dictate how things should go in the organization and put it on their purity rings, them losing that power struggle, and everyone still getting AI models. Uh, what are what are the issues here that they they don't, they lost power? They made a power play and lost. Is that what the issues are here? Because that's what it is, and you guys are salty. You played the game, you lost, and now you're trying to go for the moral high ground. Don't know what more to say to you. You were winning at Google, um, even though you were causing a lot of issues internally and the world was losing because we weren't getting models. But you tried to play the same card at OpenAI, and you lost, and now you're out in the cold. Go get a job at Anthropic. So let's talk about why we need regulations. Great, let's do it. So... Uh, from my perspective, AI went from the sci-fi thing that seemed far away to something that's pretty much everywhere, and regulators are suddenly trying to catch up. But I think for some people, it might not be obvious why exactly we need regulations at all. Like for the average person, it might seem like, oh, we just have these cool new tools like DALI and ChatGPT that do these amazing things. What exactly are we worried about in concrete terms? There's very basic stuff for very basic forms of the technology, like if people are using it to decide who gets a loan, to decide who gets parole, um, you know, to decide. Okay, first of all, um, there's laws that judges can't um, 
the vest, the power that that was given to them by our society, they can't outsource it to third party vendors, and they especially can't outsource it to uh, AI systems. <laughs> it's already it's already on the books. Um, another thing, states are already passing laws saying that you can't make hiring decisions based upon like AI. And also, why would you want to do that? Uh, because these systems are probability machines and the audit trail of how they made the decisions is kind of tough unless you use like analogical reasoners and whatnot, but you can't, it's like going through court and like looking at all these weights and buy it. So instead it's like, hmm, we're fa we could face a lot of legal risk, um, a lot of uh, issues regarding fair employment and how we made hiring decisions, protected classes. I don't know any HR team is like, ah, just give it to the LLMs. So who gets to buy a house like you need that technology to again buying the house too. uh governments uh have the, the, it's funny i know a lot of folks who are like i like free markets they're great and I, you know i don't want to go into politics but like there's a lot of people who are like oh free markets this that and that free markets and then they're real estate investors it's like real estate's the most socialized investment in human history <laughs> I mean, ever, like the whole concept of a thirty-year loan didn't exist until like the after the Great Depression and Fannie and Freddie were made. And back then, it was like seven-year term loans floating, and you had to come up with half your payment, which also helped prevent real estate prices from skyrocketing to what they are now, of like zero percent down, thirty-year fixed. Me, um, but there's so much regulation in real estate right now. I, if you were saying we were making credit decisions with LLMs, oh God, lawyers would love that case. Oh, they would make the they would make the loan the banks pay for that one. Well, if that technology is going to be discriminatory, which AI often is, it turns out, um, you need to make sure that AI is discriminatory. I AI is echoing back what is given to it. It's echoing back the best of humanity and the worst of humanity. It's not actively choosing to be discriminatory, um, and they also done alignment training and things like that like these are most of the time people are using these models for just like help me get some work done help me uh, write a message out help me summarize something help me do some research it they're not we're not at the point where people are like all my cognitive work i'm just gonna model make all the decisions I and mean, maybe if you're like watching david shapiro's show but like to make your cognitive decisions of like do I, do I put my uh, ghostbusters pajamas on or my elon musk pajamas on lm tell me what to do but for people who are actually doing real work, no, we're we're saving the cognitive work for ourselves. It's just the bitch work we're giving to the models. People have recourse. They can go back and say, hey, why was this decision made? If we're talking AI being used in the military, that's a whole other kettle of fish. Um, and is not, I don't know if we would say like regulation for that, but certainly need to have guidance, rules, processes in place. And then kind of looking forward and thinking about more advanced AI systems, I think there, you know, there's a pretty wide range of potential harms that we we could well see if AI keeps getting increasingly sophisticated. You know, letting every little script kitty in their parents' basement having the hacking capabilities of, you know, a crack NSA cell. Like, uh, no, <laughs> come on, engineers, you're listening to this. Did you hear what she just said? Come, LLMs. Uh, y'all, come on. You just said the LLMs are going to be able to, like, the hack as well as, like, some NSA cell. Come on. Come on. I mean, has, anyone, has anyone gotten this thing to, like, do Python? I mean, it does Python pretty well, but it's like, uh, uh, could you help me to crack encryption on these banks? It's like, it's like no, it's two different, like, different things. Uh, I was talking to my friend's mathematician. And he was telling me about the whole math behind how encryption works. He was like, "Yeah, you would need like a quantum computer to do, to crack certain things because to do normal calculations for number another computer to crack to crack it would take like x thousands of years or something." So people like to do is like get AI and they mix in like deep fakes, which is not AI related, or quantum computing, or like all the uh, nuclear war. They like, keep stuffing it into here, and it's like it, Ellen's like, "Hi, I'm Clippy 2.0." Uh, I just do next token prediction. <laughs> I can make you a really fun poem, but then I forget what I said last time. Like, <laughs> but, like come on, you can't, it's like total Gary Marcus world. But no, there, it's you're giving Python scripts at best. And I think if you asked, like, hey, can you code up something so I can like, like, uh, uh, create a, a a virus or something else like that, it's gonna be like, no, I can't create viruses. It's gonna stop you there. Um, so. Uh, yeah, okay. I know, yes, also, 
there is some jail ways to jailbreak it. We did a paper on a on ASCII or something, but as soon as a jailbreak happens, they fix it and patch it. Um, okay, Rock says, I'd be careful with saying that AI inherently is good to help society for the simple reason that companies can create these big models and have no legal or moral obligations to make it more more fair society. Thank you for putting words in my mouth. I really appreciate that, but... Uh, every technology is morally neutral. Like I said beginning of the show, you give Grok fire, Grok might say, Ooh, me, 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 use this to stay warm and help family and then maybe cook on it. And then you give it to Trok, and Trok's like, mm, me put Grok's family to the torch and kill. Like, that's, that's, that's the issue. But if you ask me, do you think, uh, do you think that these elements are net good for society? I'm going to say yes. And you can fight me on it if you think, no, there's not nearly bad. That's, that's your belief. This is my belief, but whatever. That's a problem. I think something that really makes AI hard for regulators to, to think about is that it is so many different things, and plenty of the things don't need regulation. Like, I don't know that how Spotify decides how to make your, your playlist, the AI that they use for that. that. Like, I'm happy for Spotify to just pick whatever songs they want for me, and if they get it wrong, you know, who cares? Um, but for many, many other use cases, you want to have at least some kind of basic common sense guardrails around it. Uh, but that's her opinion. Neither are people who say they want to have some 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 legislation over it too. I, there are all different types of folks, but inherently though is why are you making this jump to now we need legislation over this stuff when these people who are releasing these models already have been doing a pretty good job of aligning them, making them safe. There's always issues with any new technology. Uh, case is still very hazy. It's not 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 clear at all. I want to talk about a few specific examples that we might want to worry about not in some battle space overseas, but at home in our day-to-day -day lives. You know, let's talk about surveillance. AI has gotten really good at perception, essentially understanding the contents of images, video, and audio. Yep. And we've got a growing number of surveillance cameras in public and private spaces. And now companies are infusing AI into this fleet, essentially breathing intelligence into these otherwise dumb sensors that are almost everywhere. Yep. Madison Square Garden uh, in New York City is an example. They've been using facial recognition technology to bar lawyers involved in lawsuits against their parent company, MSG Entertainment, from attending events at their venue. Uh, this controversial practice obviously raised concerns about privacy, due process, and potential for abuse of this technology. Can we talk about why this is problematic? Yeah, I mean, I think this is a pretty common thing that comes up in the history of technology is you have some, you know, some existing thing in society and then technology makes it much faster and much cheaper and much more widely available. Like surveillance where it goes from like, oh, it used to be the case that your neighbor could see you doing something bad and go talk to the police about it. You know, it's one step up to go to, well, there's a camera, a CCTV camera and the police can go back and check at any time. And then another step up to like, oh, actually it's just running all the time and there's an AI facial recognition detector on there. And maybe, you know, maybe in the future an AI like activity detector that's also flagging, you know, this looks suspicious. Um, I, I, in some ways there's no like qualitative change in what's happened. It's just like you could be seen doing something. But I think you do also need to grapple with the fact that if it's much more ubiquitous, much cheaper, then, then the situation is different. I mean, I think with surveillance, people immediately go to the kind of law enforcement use cases. And I think it is really important to figure out what the right trade-offs are between achieving sort of law enforcement objectives and, and being able to catch criminals and, and, you know, prevent bad things from happening while also recognizing, you know, the, the huge issues that you can get if this technology is used with overreach. For example, you know, facial recognition works better and worse on different demographic groups. And so if police are, as they have been in some parts of the country, going and arresting people purely on a facial recognition match and on no other evidence, there's a story about a woman who was eight months pregnant having contractions in a jail cell after having done absolutely nothing wrong and being arrested only on the basis of a, you know, a bad facial recognition match. So I personally don't go for, you know, the, this needs to be totally banned and no one should ever use it in any way for anything. But I think you really need to be looking at how are people using it? What happens when it goes wrong? What recourse do people have? What kind of access to due process do they have? And we already, we already have due process. Um, and there are always those edge cases where things get messed up and thank God we can see those edge cases and thank God person can get due process. They can sue, they can get things fixed and we improve and that's how things have always gone. And so anyways, I could go longer on this video, but 
I, I just think that she's um, she has an axe to grind, trying to make a power play, it didn't work out, um, and thank God this chapter is over for OpenAI and they can move forward. If I was Sam, I would continue doing what I'm what I'm doing, and I would like not try to like oh I'm going to go after her legally, and it's, it's like put that person in a rearview window. You put Ilya in the rearview window. You don't focus on it anymore. You just focus on forward and building the future because every time you give them more attention, it gives more life to the story and you can't get rid of them. So the best thing to do is like what people did at Google. We had Tristan Harris who was talking about, oh, there's too many notifications on your phone and blah, blah, blah. We had one team controlling all notifications and we know what's right for people. And then we're like, nah, and he eventually left the company. And then you create his whole his whole thing about like how social media is destroying everyone in society. Um, just like... This is a uh, a video that JMT, uh, JMT shared with me. Let's watch this video real quick. This is in our Discord. Okay, history of quotes. 2001, they have trouble making decisions. They would rather hike in the Himalayas than climb a corporate ladder. 2001, 1993, it's the first generation in American history lives so well and complains so bitterly about it. Article the Washington Post. 1951, many young people were so pampered nowadays and they had forgotten that there was such a thing as walking. 1951, 1933, women painted like prostitutes, throwing off every kind of social restraint. All these go to prove that it's no, it's now the vulgar mob that gives tone. 1925, an attitude on the part of the young folk, which is best described as grossly thoughtless, rude, and utterly selfish. 1843, girls who drive coal carts, ride astride upon horses, drink, swear, fight, smoke, whistle, and care for nobody. The morals of children are tenfold worse than formerly. Also, Joe was telling me that the rise of the bicycle, like the standard bicycle, back in the day, people were saying, well, if now women could ride bicycles, then they're going to date more and become promiscuous, and we can't allow this technology like to destroy women. And it's just like, <laughs> geez, crazy backwards thinking. Uh, 1790, the free access which many young people have to romances, novels, and plays has poisoned the mind and corrupted the morals of many uh, of many youth. So now if you find a kid and he's reading a novel, you're like, oh, wow, the kid's reading. This is great. And back then it was like, oh, you're wasting your time. Doing this. this is terrible. It's corrupting you. And I kind of look at social media the same way as kids aren't allowed to do a lot of things anymore. So it's like, I guess I'll just play around on my, on my phone and watch TikTok videos. 1624, youth were never more... Saucy, yet never more savagely saucy. The ancients are scorned. The honorable are damned. 1330, modern fashions seem to keep on growing more and more debased. The ordinary spoken language has also stayed declined. Circa 20 BC, our sire's age was worse than our grandsires. We, their sons, are more worthless than they. So in our turn, we shall give the world a progeny yet more corrupt. First century BC, the beardless youth does not foresee what is useful, squandering money, Horace. Fourth century BC, young people are high-minded because they have not yet been humbled by life. They think they know everything and are always quite sure about it. Uh, anyways, we always uh, find, as, as Peach said, uh, moral panics of our time. We always just find a scapegoat, anything, new technology or whatnot, and it's just reflects back human nature. We don't like what we see. So then we start attacking the creators and we're seeing this right now in AI. So anyways, um, I hope you all have a fantastic weekend. If, if you like what we're doing here, hit that join button, support us or support us on Patreon, patreon.com forward slash sick. Get access to all of our old uh, live streams. Get access to our Discord where the, where the conversations continue. We share ideas, talk about next episodes coming up. Um, Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday, 11 a.m. to noon is when we do our live stream. So make sure you're available. If you have team meetings, cancel them. Um, if you can, just like tell your manager to have a doctor's appointment or just tell them like this is your emotional support show. And for you to continue doing your job, you need 11 a.m. to 12 p.m. Pacific Standard Time, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, free. So uh, thank you all. Thank you all for your contributions to the comment section. I love all the engagement. Too many great comments to get on here, but we'll get them in the future. Thank you for being awesome. Talk to you all later. See you in Discord. Bye.